involved with Bitcoin and Bitcoin related projects since 2012, actually in 2011, this is part of the interest you also dropped. Um, in 2011, I was sitting at Bel Air for the library bought it, and uh, a buddy of mine told me about Bitcoin, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what I told him, but I basically told him to F off with this fake magic money. And about nine months after I did that, I literally woke up from a dead sleep about 3 a.m. one day and everything clicked. And everything just kind of made sense as to why this was important, what we were doing here, and where this is going. So that's when I got in pretty heavy in 2012, and that's about 30 to 40 percent of the reason why I can retire now at 40 years old. So I do this, I do this because I enjoy it, I do it because I legitimately love this, and as a Scottish libertarian, I love the freedom aspect of where this is taking us. So that's kind of where we're going to go. If you have technical questions, if you have philosophical questions, ask away. Because, because my normal class is about three hours, it should be about eight, but I can't get adults to somehow commit to two nights in a row. I had to boil it down to three, which means I don't have enough time to get the whole class here, so I'm going to be doing almost entirely Q&A. What you guys are interested in, what you guys want to know, let's talk about that. What you saw in the news, what you think about it. So right now, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin on a technical level is a decentralized, publicly accessible ledger system. That's all. Why is that important? All those words together really don't make a whole lot of sense, typically. Decentralization? means that no one controls it. If you use your Visa card, someone authorized your card to be used, someone besides you. Some central authority authorized your card besides you. Keep in mind, Bitcoin, we still have authorizations. We still have what's called miners, which process transactions, which authorize your transactions. But whereas in a Visa system, if they decide, if Visa decides I can't use my card, then I can't use my card. If an individual miner decides I can't send my Bitcoin, I've got 10,000 more miners behind them that don't care what he thinks. <laughs> the term you want to you recognize in that is financial censorship. As Americans, we have a hard time getting our head around that. We feel like we have control over our money. We feel as though we can do what we want with it, but I can promise you if you try and send a large amount of money overseas, you're going to see how little control you really have. As an example, by a client of mine eight months ago, he needed to send a million, a little under a million U.S. over to Singapore to get tools in for his tool and die shop materials. <clears throat> Three days of filling out paperwork, and he realized that it wasn't his money. Even though he wasn't getting a loan, it was his money in the bank account. He couldn't send it over there without authorization from his bank and the U.S. government. Are we all? Maybe I'm going to take some. So, so what is Bitcoin? Decentralized. Again, that means no one person can control what I do with my money. Again, why is that important? Then as anyone who's from Venezuela or has ties in Venezuela, you will see why financial censorship is important. 35 to 40% of the medicine last, of course, stats are what they are. But 35 to 40 percent of the medicine coming into Venezuela right now is because of Bitcoin, because they can't send money overseas. And Venezuela cannot produce everything they need, like most countries. Most countries don't produce everything they need. So the ability to send it across borders is what's keeping a lot of those people alive right now while their, while their government screws their economy. And I know maybe somebody in here wants to give me an argument for socialism. We'll do that later. So decentralization means no one controls it. You are in 100% control of everything you do with your money. The downside of that is that means if you lose your money, I can't get it back. You can't call Visa up, you can't call Bitcoin up and say, hey, look, give me my money back for me. So you have to, if you're going to go into this space, you have to learn how to manage it. If you want to be your own bank, you have to learn the responsible side. Of it. But we'll talk about it later. So decentralized online ledger system. So we've heard of the blockchain, right? Everybody in here has heard of the blockchain, right? So what is the blockchain? Let's talk about our ledger system for a second, and then I think after that we'll, we'll go into questions. <clears throat> the blockchain is very simply a series of files, in the case of Bitcoin, created every 10 minutes, that have your transactions, your changes in it, 
that each file is mathematically linked. I would use the white word thing to stay up there. Right? I don't want to draw this out. Each file is mathematically linked to the next file on the chain. Why does that matter? Because that means that if I change one thing in block A, everything after block A changes because I changed something in block A. It means I can put that ledger system, I can put those series of transactions on any computer in the world, and I know that they're legitimate just through basic math, that any computer can crunch out a couple seconds. What's that mean? I can put my money anywhere in the world and know that I have my money. It's trustless. It's not trustless. I actually don't like that term. It's not trustless. It's assuming I shouldn't trust you. It's untrusted, not trustless. So the math in the blockchain, the blockchain is a series of files in which the next file is mathematically linked to the file before it. Keeping you from being able to counterfeit, change transactions, screw the system. So blockchain is a technology that runs Bitcoin, runs all cryptos. That's important to know because if you ever hear about an ICO or let's say a project going on, like IOTA, that was claiming that they don't have a blockchain, they are lying to you. I promise you that. They are absolutely 100% lying to you. And that's why I told my friends not to buy into IOTA. We would digress a bit because I like showing that I'm right about things. And told them not to buy into IOTA, and IOTA project failed shortly thereafter because they were lying to people, and you can tell that by the margin. But anyway, so blockchain is a technology. Blockchain is the engine that runs the car. I can throw an engine in a Ford, a Honda, a Chevy, or whatever. Blockchain is technology. That's also important to know because when you hear about companies that are adopting blockchain technology, it's not mean there's going to be any change in Bitcoin. They are not related. So, that's a very quick, very basic overview. Now, who's got a question? Unless we want to spend the next hour awkwardly staring at each other. Go ahead. I'm wondering how you feel about real world use cases. Sorry? All right, so my question is about real-world use cases for blockchain other than just currency. VeChain comes to mind. I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are. What was the chain? VeChain is the it's an ERC-20 token. It's going to launch mainnet, I think, in this quarter. Okay, so let me talk about ERC-20 tokens in general. So there's three, let's, let's just say there's three primarily accepted cryptos out in the world that most people know about. There's Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, there's Litecoin, right? ERC-20 token. ERC-20 just denotes the protocol that allows these things to exist. So ERC just means on the Ethereum chain. So it sounds really fancy, but it just means that, hey, the 20th idea we had allows these tokens to exist. That's all ERC-20 is. So let's talk about tokens in general. So what we've, what we've created is, when I say ICO, is you can usually interchange that with the word token. What an ICO, a token, is is a representation of a project or a company. If I wanted to raise money for my project, I could go out there and create an ERC-20 token on the Ethereum blockchain. It would exist as a separate line entry in my wallet. And by physical, let's say physical, okay, by physical possession of that token in my wallet, I own a part of that project. You guys know what stocks are, right? This is just a stock that exists on the Ethereum network. Make sense? Just a share stock. Now, not knowing about VeChain in particular, is that the one that's doing the food supply? Is that what that is? It's, it's logistics and supply chain. Management. That's right. Okay. That's right. There's there's 7,100 ICOs out there right now, so bear with me. But, um, let me give you general advice about ICOs if you're looking at it from an investment standpoint. 80% of all legitimate businesses that people start fail in the first five years. And that's businesses where you live down the street from me. Follow me? There's a responsibility there. If you steal my money, I can show up with a bat and get my money back. Make sense? I can take care of this situation because of physical proximity. 80% of those businesses fail in the first five years. Take away the fact that I can show up with a bat and get my money back and tell me how many scams are going to show up. The first year of ICOs, and I'm not talking about VeChain in particular, because I, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know enough about them to give you an opinion. 
But we'll talk about blockchain implementation on real world projects here in a second. So, um, it's been a long morning. I was in Cleveland this morning yelling at somebody else. Um, what was I talking about? Beat your bank attention. What Sorry? Business failure rates. Failure rates, that's right. So, the first year that we had really the big ICO push, ICOs were coming out tremendously. Like, like just hundreds and thousands of them in the last year. So people were just throwing things on the Ethereum chain, making an ICO, putting a token out there, and, and no one knew a damn thing about them. People were just buying them. Because it was the 90s and the internet craze. We all remember that. I was in high school at the time. Um, and people were just going nuts. We go through these hypes every once in a while. And every kind of new paradigm kind of changes. And 76% of those are gone. First year. They still exist on the chain, because you can't really believe them. But 76% of those are not answering emails, not picking up the phone. I do this research for a living, and I got scammed for about $1,200 from a loan release token. The developer ran off with money. Pretty sure we found him in the DNA. Not the reason I'm going to fill it in this time. So, Point is, is that no matter how much research you do, no matter how much you live in this space, there's a very good chance, percentage-wise, you're going to come across some of these scams. You're going to lose some money. So be very, very careful about ICOs. The the hype around this is opinion, but as I said earlier, I always believe I'm right. Probably why I'm not married. And uh, so I would stay away from ICOs because the hype of ICOs is over. As evidenced by the fact, this is going to get a little bit on the end that I didn't really want to get into, um, but personal theory, if you watch Ethereum, Ethereum dropped from 1,100-ish a coin in February to about 350, okay? People have their theories, like I said, mine's the right one, so I'm going to give it to you. Back two weeks before the Ethereum system crashed, let's say, people use that term. Two weeks before, two and a half weeks before, South Korea, uh, America, China, Australia, the UK, and Canada. Though I'm not really counting Canada as a financial powerhouse, Canada was one of them. These major financial countries came out with their regulators and said, we're going to get ready to crack down on ICOs. They are unregistered securities. We are investing in these securities without going through the proper channels. All you're doing is issuing stock in projects. All you're doing is selling snake oil to people, okay? And with nothing to back it up. Now, we can say we want against Scottish Libertarian. Okay, I'm going to go against a little bit of what I believe here. But regulation in this case, I'm actually kind of for because if you go onto the stock market, it's not just a simple matter of you paying the money to the government. Like everyone wants to, everyone wants to simplify things so much. Facebook is just vomit. Um, right, Pete? And uh, so my point is you can't listen to people on Facebook. Registering a security, you can't boil things down the way they do. Registering a security is not only paying the government money. What you're doing is you are being audited by the government. You have to follow standard accounting practices. You have to show you have a real business. Huh? You actually have a, an idea of how you're going to make money for these people who are giving you money. I mean, go figure. That's a terrible thing, right? So going around those processes means you're, you're just some dude in a garage. You decide at least token out in the world makes money. And about 80% of those were exactly that. So, when all these governments come together and they go, we're getting ready to crack down on ICOs, which those five countries, or six countries, where most of the ICOs are located, especially China. Uh, when they say they're going to crack down on those, what happens? Well, if I released a token on the Ethereum network, what did I get paid in? Ethereum. Bingo. So I'm holding on to these big reserves of Ethereum. We're all economic students, right? If I take a bunch of Ethereum off the market, what have I done? I've shrunk supply. Price goes up. People want to invest in more ICOs. They don't care what the price of Ethereum is. They're just taking somebody else to buy part of the project. So it doesn't matter what the price is. They're just transferred off somewhere else anyway. So I take all this artificial, I artificially remove all the supply and lock up these ICOs. And we are talking thousands of ICOs. Multiple, multiple billion dollars worth of ICOs and Ethereum were taken on the market because of ICOs. So they're holding on to this Ethereum money. They're not going to convert it into fiat currency, which is your 
South Korea, whatever they use, uh, dollars. Which Canada? I don't even know that. Dollars? Canadian dollars. Canadian dollars, thank you. Whatever. The point is, they're not going to convert it into their governmental currency because they have to pay taxes on it right away. So what do they do? They hold on to it. They store it. The price keeps going up because they're, they keep gathering more supply. Then the governments come out and they say, we're getting ready to crack down on you. What are you going to do? Sell off everything you have. You're going to convert all the fee up until the government comes along and shuts you down. So we have this massive sell-off right after all the governments come out and say that we're getting ready to shut you down. Or at least make things pretty difficult for you. And that's when a lot of ICOs went out of business. Took the money and ran. So the massive, what I'm getting at is, is that I believe because of that, the ICO hype is over. You'll find a few here and there. I would not go into any more ICOs right now. In fact, this weekend I plan on taking all my side coins and putting them on to Bitcoin. I'm going to have about 50% of what I have in Bitcoin. I'll tell you why that in a minute. Um, I believe the hype for Ethereum is primarily over. I think we're going to be a slow growth stock from this point forward. If you assume that the $700 drop, roughly, uh, was because I'm right, and it is, then you have to assume that probably $500 of that was the ICO selling off, probably another $200 was panic sales. If the ICOs were profiting with the price by $500 a coin, then stands to reason with no more ICO hype, it's going to be a while before we get back to five, another $500. Make sense? So now let's go over real world cases of blockchain technology. There's a blockchain where blockchain gets its efficiency is simply a, a searchable, let's go back. All blockchain is, is a searchable list of changes. In this case, it's change in balances. I sent to Pete's account, Pete sent money to my account. Those are changes in accounts, right? So what else can we do with change that, that, that just change? What about death records? Birth records. Illinois is working on that, I guess, when they find the money. Um, and they're working on implementing the blockchain. See, the, the political commentary, Pete, that's weird. Um, Illinois is working on switching their death and birth certificates over to blockchain. I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, there's a county in Georgia right now that's working on switching all their tax records over to blockchain. Walmart is toying with the idea of, like, Bitcoin, being able to track everything that goes on with the tree, everything that goes on with every piece of fruit, and everything that goes on at every piece of store they have. Anytime any product moves, from the time that they have ordered it, actually really grown it, to the time it is sold to the customer, they're going to track that through blockchain. Blockchain is the most efficient. Blockchain is the most efficient database we have right now to monitor changes in items. If that makes sense. So you can implement blockchain pretty much anywhere that you want to keep track of something. Here, it is. I mean, just where it is. Unfortunately, I'm not a programmer. I can't get much, much more into it than that. What else do we have? Any of that answer? Okay. What else we got, guys? Yes. Hello. Um, with Lightning Network and other updates to Bitcoin, why are you bullish on Litecoin and Bcash? Whoa, that's a loaded question. I never said I was up. I was, well, I was up on Bcash. I know that's what I said. The after. To in China? Oh, 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 I wrote that almost nine months ago. Oh, sorry. Uh, Roger Burr is a pile of garbage. Um, Roger Burr is going to charge with eCash, and I love the fact that he called it that, by the way. That's great. Um, here's the thing. B I'll say, so Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash is a fork all of Bitcoin network. Let's go back a little bit and explain what that is. So if you, let's see if I can use this white over here. So remember, every 10 minutes, we're making a block, right? Every 10 minutes. Now, what's every block have in it? A header, a footer, and a bunch of transactions in it. Header's a bunch of numbers, footer's a bunch of numbers. We're going very simple here, okay? So when I say they're mathematically tied, this footer goes in as the header of the next and creates the mathematical chain for the next block. 
So it makes sense? So meaning, if I take this, I don't know, I think it's like, what is it, like 200 characters now? Something. Um, if I take this, anything in here, and change anything in this block, I've changed this answer here. Okay, now, again, we're going to keep it simple. Meaning, if I change it here, I change it here, which changes this number, which changes this number. Follow me? They're mathematically tied to each other. That's where your integrity comes from. That's where your trustless system comes from. So, if we're making these blocks, right? That's not actually related to what I'm answering right now. It's just, I just want to show that. So, I'm making these blocks, right? And we have what's called a hard fork. This is where Bcash came from. And at the time I wrote that, I did think, if you read the monetary policy of Bcash, it is very, very in line with Chinese financial policy. That's why I thought Bcash was going to become... I'll go over the theory of Bcash here in a minute. I'll go over that. So let's talk about hard forks. So we've got these blocks being made, right? What denotes Bitcoin? Any programmers in here? Anyone taking a programming class? Yeah? Yeah. So what denotes Bitcoin? I know, it's completely unrelated to what you're saying. Yeah. So, Bitcoin is just a set of rules. The Bitcoin network, among other rules, mainly states that if you want to be part of our network, you have to make blocks that are no longer than one bed. You have to make a block around every 10 minutes. Okay? And you have to have in your blocks, and this isn't exact, it's actually a little lower than that, but you have to have blocks, that to know that we can't have more than 20 million systems. You change any of the hard rules of Bitcoin, and now you're a different network. And we reject you. Code is law. The code says you have to follow these protocols. So what do we have? We have a guy named Roger Ver working with the Chinese government, I, I think. I'll go over that in a second. Who decided that he was going to change the APEC block? Everything else is the same. What happens? We continue with Bitcoin, and we now have a new one called garbage. <laughs> so, here's what a hard fork is. I'm making the blocks, which are the transaction history. They're just transaction history. That's all it is. So I have all these transaction histories here, and then all of a sudden somebody changes the rules. We stop, we stop making blocks for them. We stop allowing them to use our network. They are no longer compatible with the way our universe works. They exist in their own space. Bitcoin Cash came from that. That's what Bitcoin Cash is. The interesting part about hard forks, because the transaction history is the same. Am I just going to spawn where it didn't pick me up here? What happens? Um, because the transaction history is the same, if you had 50 Bitcoin here, you got 50 Bitcoin over here the day they did the split. I'm sorry, you got 50 Bitcoin Cash over here. Whatever you had at the time of the split, you have on the new chain. Because we shared it at a certain point. And when my wallet, we're going to go in something I probably should talk about in a second. And then when my wallet opens up, my wallet is checking my balance. My wallet doesn't tell me I have 10 Bitcoin. Wish it did. Uh, my wallet doesn't tell me I have 10 Bitcoin. My wallet goes, hey, back in 2012, someone sent me three. And hey, back in 2013, someone sent me two. Somewhere in 14, I sent two to somebody. Follow me? It's a ledger system. Every time I open my wallet, it goes through the blocks, and it figures out what my new balance is. Every time I open my wallet. Why is that important? Because it's going through this transaction history just like Bitcoin Cash is going through when we share it. Does that make sense? That's why I have 15 on both. Do you want to hear my theory on Bitcoin Cash, or do you want to go on to the, on to the next part of the... I'm going to tell you. So, Bitcoin Cash, two and a half, three years ago, we had a group called Bitcoin Unlimited. And keep in mind, keep in mind, keep in mind, we've had 12, I think, hard forks off the Bitcoin network in the last five years. They've amounted to nothing. The only reason, the only reason they have any value, which quite frankly is the only reason any of this has value is because somebody believes in it. Somebody's willing to give you money for it. That's it. Bitcoin Cash 
has value because people believe in it. Primarily because Roger Burr has a lot of money in marketing. So you go back about three, four years ago. I really like the human side of this kind of issue. You go back about three, four years ago, there was a group called Bitcoin Unlimited. And there's another group in there somewhere. Anyway, they tried to split the Bitcoin protocol into a hard fork. And because four years ago, everyone who had money in Bitcoin were a bunch of nerds who knew better, okay, who weren't chasing money, none of us supported them. And his chain died off. It's consensus. That's what's great about this. This is democratic. If no one buys it, if no one goes into it, if no one uses it, it has no value, it dies. That's where the other 11 or so splits it in, other than the gold reason. So, they try and split it off in Bitcoin Unlimited. Bitcoin Unlimited was about 80% Chinese miners and Chinese government officials. Fast forward about two years, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Bitcoin Cash pops up. If you look at the people who founded Bitcoin Cash, publicly about 50% of those, those guys were part of the Bitcoin Unlimited group. I don't know what the other half is. Point is, the reason Bitcoin Unlimited gave as an excuse to split the network, this is the perfect mix of technology and people, it's just my thing. So the reason Bitcoin Unlimited gave to split the networks. At the time, we were talking about a consensus change of changing the blocks to two megs. We would have to actually split the coin into a new Bitcoin that supported two meg blocks. Bitcoin can, or Bitcoin Unlimited came out and said, no, we can't do that. Primarily the Chinese miners, we can't get two meg blocks between us and the Great Firewall. It would be too slow for us. Our internet connection isn't good enough. Tick, 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 tick. And then two years later, that exact group goes to eight meg blocks. What's that tell you? They're aligned. That wasn't what they were doing. They just wanted to split. So now they're eight blocks. You're telling me all of a sudden now we've got four times the size of the data blocks that you were complaining about four years ago, and now it's okay? No, because they just found a new excuse. But now they've got enough of a market. This is probably the best economic lesson you'll get out of this entire thing. Because they have an uninformed market, we have a coin over here that has really no extra use. Does it make sense? You guys are economics people, right? Yeah? Okay. Am I that boring? No ways. Okay. So, anyway, does that answer your question? I'm not, I, I'm bullish on Bitcoin Cash as an investment to get more Bitcoin. I don't like the project. Does that make sense? What about Litecoin? Litecoin I've always liked. Charlie Lee is awesome. Um, I really liked it. That was the first altcoin that was programmed out of the Bitcoin protocol. Um, I thought, when I wrote that, I think I put it in there, right? Uh, that I thought Litecoin was going to be Amazon's coin of choice. And I was buying Litecoin because I felt as though Amazon was going to take it because it made more sense. Why take Bitcoin? Slower. Sports, it's one fourth as fast. Uh, transaction fees were higher. So I thought Amazon was going to take Litecoin. Now I like like right now now I think I think your question I think your question roots itself in the idea that there can only be one one crypto. Right? Like why I like Litecoin if Bitcoin's gonna win. Is that fair? If, if Bitcoin can be cheaper and it is getting cheaper, then oh, we're seeing it cheaper. in ten years why will Litecoin still because I don't believe that one cryptocurrency, keep in mind, former network engineer, so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. I don't believe that. Centralization is good for efficiency. Decentralization is terrible for efficiency. Everything you buy in Bitcoin, I have to send 12, 13,000 places on the internet. Everything you buy with Bitcoin, I have to send 12 to 13,000 places on the internet. Let that soak in. Every coffee you want to buy, every sandwich you want to buy, everything has to be sent to a group of nodes so everyone can keep track of it. That is terribly efficient. Now, Lightning Network is going to solve all of that. Okay? But I still don't think even Lightning Network, the peer to peer, uh, it's called bar tab system that they have, is enough to handle the coffee traffic of everyone in the world. Make sense? 
If you believe that, and I do, then you have to believe there's going to be more than one cryptocurrency for the world. So my original thought before Litecoin Network came out, and this will give you just an idea of where I'm thinking on this. Before Lightning Network was a thing, this is why I developed this theory. At the time before Lightning Network, the most we thought we could push a cryptocurrency, a decentralized cryptocurrency, was the coffee transactions. You guys understand what I mean by coffee transactions. Those are daily versus like, like your everyday use kind of transactions. We could push the coffee transactions to about half a billion people. Ish. Right? With everything that we're currently doing to increase the efficiency and everything we think we can do, with everything that might be theoretical, the number thrown around was about 500 million people. Well, if you do the basic math, that means we need 16 cryptos for the world, right? Right there. But that's only taking into the technical element. Then you have taken into human efficiency, nothing runs at 100%, and then you figure probably 2022. And then you figure out that America won't use the crypto that China uses, and China won't use Russia's. And then you start throwing in human, philosophical, nationalistic kind of tendencies, and you realize we're probably closer to 50. Does that make sense? That's what I was thinking when I was looking at those things. Uh, China, the Chinese government wants to control their currency, and I really thought Bitcoin cash was the way that we were trying to do it. At the time I wrote that. I should have been there. Of course, I can't imagine what it So that's another reason why I like Litecoin. I think it's a contender to be one of the main ones at the end. You know, quite frankly, I'm not sure from an investment standpoint, and do not go invest money based on this. Um, I'm not sure from an investment standpoint you could make a bad decision on a commodity-based currency right now. Not ICOs, not tokens, none of that. But commodity-based currency like Bitcoin, Litecoin, even Doge, it's funny as that is. Um, anyway, sorry, did that answer that? Okay. Questions? Come on, guys. Yeah. Hey, wait, wait. Oh, oh. Protocol, protocol. Down front. Oh, hold on, real quick, real quick. Let me cover this real quick. I actually, I forgot to say this before. Shameless, shameless self-promotion. If you go to Udemy.com. And search for my last name, Barter. My class comes right up, it's free. If you want to learn more about this, the class is there. So anyway, it's, it's a three hour class, we turn it into a whole bunch of videos. It probably sucks, but it's the first one I made, so be nice. And keep in mind, if you give a review, I do see your name. Uh, go ahead. All right, so my question is with Litecoin, why are you so bullish considering that Charlie Lee has liquidated all of his assets? Of Charlie Lee didn't liquidate his assets because he was afraid. Charlie Lee liquidated his assets because he was afraid that people were thinking that he was pumping things up with his tweets. So when Charlie Lee says that I was afraid that people were not going to listen to me because I, because I had too much skin in the game, because I was, I was benefiting too much, I believe him on that. He hasn't stopped developing. But considering that's like a natural thing in the crypto environment to where people do do that, why would he do that even? I mean, he's better than that. You see that like McAfee continually pumps coins. Hold on a second. Hold on. Are we using McAfee as a as a basis for other crypto guys? I'm, I'm just. You realized he actually he actually bet that he would eat his own penis if it didn't hit a certain price. Right. Okay. Right. Just making sure we're clear. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> on national television, I might add. Yeah, he's nuts. In fact, I have a client of mine who sold him several cars. Yeah, he's right. insane. Um, and then my other one is there's vast more currencies. Like yeah. Nano for one, that is more, that is better in my opinion, faster than Bitcoin and Litecoin. So where do you see something like that going? Who's Nano? Nano? Yeah, I've never heard of Nano. RSV. Never heard of it. Sorry? It was right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, man, there's 7,000 of them out there. And then, so unless it hit my map, I can change it. I got gotcha. you. Last question is, why don't you have Binance listed on the exchanges? When I wrote that nine months ago, I didn't like Binance. Really? Yeah, I was worried about Binance and their accounts. Now, now I have a Binance account. Like I said, that hasn't been updated in close to a year. Actually, it's May? Oh yeah, it's been a year. 
this week. Um, so yeah, I like Binance now. I actually have an account with them. Um, most of the exchanges, even Yobit, I've kind of warmed up to a little bit. You have to understand, about a year ago, a lot of these exchanges were just starting to get out there. Okay? And my job is to make sure that people don't lose money doing stupid shit. So I have to take things from a very cautious angle because my job is to teach people how not to lose money. So I can't sit there and recommend an exchange that at the time I had not used myself. So to go back to, don't get me wrong, there's other coins that are out there that are great. NEO, I own NEO, I own OMG. I even own some ERC20 tokens, Edwin, Salt, a few others. Cardano, I actually really like Cardano. But when I give sheets like that, I have to temper what I'm telling people with what they can handle. And most people can't handle 15 exchange accounts. You know what I mean? So you gotta plan, you gotta ease them in. This class that I give is an intro class. When people want to know more intro, then they sit down and go over specifics. And I make sure that I'm gonna do something stupid like a client of mine last week, who wasn't my client until we did this who opened an account on Bitfinex and sent $2,000 worth of Bitcoin to his Bitcoin Cash wallet on Bitfinex. So in case you guys are wondering, that means he lost his $2,000. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I sent Bitfinex a, a list of things they need to do trying to get his money back. They haven't responded because it's an engineering kind of nightmare for them. Um, but anyway, so what else have we got? Anything good? Go, go ahead. Come on in. I don't know if I'm restricted on questions or not. Well, she has a protocol in place. Okay. So. And then um, I know that you were talking kind of bad about IOTA, but they just lost, yes. lost your project today. Yeah. So how are you feeling about that? Tell me how IOTA works. How it works? Tell me how it works. I'm not in IOTA, so I can't yeah. do that. That's the problem. They can't either. So, the, no, I'm being serious, I'm being right. serious. And that's the reason why I didn't want to do it, because if you go, the first sign of a scam is they can't explain what they're doing to a 10-year-old. Okay. If you can't explain to me as if I'm, let's say 15 in this space, as I'm 15 years old. I looked up, and I, I, had, I, I have a bunch of buddies who work over at Cape Cod, and they kept bothering about IOTA. I what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? So I spent one evening, going through nothing but YouTube videos on IOTA, and I wanted to kill myself. It's the most boring shit I've seen in my life. But I came out with that realizing they were just saying the same thing over and over again. Well, I mean, that's most, like, that's most of these projects. Am I correct on this? Well, now keep in mind, the statement that most projects can't explain to you what you're doing also goes with 76% of projects are out of business in the first year. That's true. So, Again, you know, it just how do you want to look at it? Yeah. Um, do we do we hold these people to the same standard we would anyone else we're giving our money to? I do. And if, if they can't hold that, then okay, what's the worst that happens? I miss out on the game, but I didn't lose my money. So there has to be a little bit of cautious optimism in what's going on here. But after going over video after video after video after video, I couldn't find a single person who was telling me what their jargon meant. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I didn't trust them. And then for ICOs, are you still pretty bearish on that, considering that I think it is South Korea opened up launching ICOs again? South Korea has opened it for the third time. Right. Uh, China is opening up again. Japan is actually very bullish on Bitcoin. I'm not, here's the thing, I'm not bearish on ICOs. I just think that the hype that we had is done. Now we're going to get into a somewhat fairly normal progression. We're not going to have 2,000 of them released in a month. Okay? We might have 15 of them released in a month, and those 15 are probably going to be pretty good quality. If you can find yourself, if you, from an investing standpoint, not a financial advisor, you're not taking my financial advice. If you can find yourself an ICO that's state sanctioned, i.e. gets institutional and old money, because that's what those guys are waiting for, then you'll make pretty good money, I believe. And then Goldman Sachs just opened up the yes. Bitcoin desk. So how are you feeling about that in ICO relation? Haven't opened it yet. They're talking about it. Right. Uh, the NASDAQ, three days ago, four days ago, about. said that they were amenable to allowing cryptocurrencies to trade on their platform. 
and Barclays or the UK just said that they're looking over a trading desk. I hate to break it to you, but they're not going to start with ICOs because ICOs aren't registered. Chances are they're going to start with the four of the point based awards. That'd be my guess. So, long term, obviously it's great because it legitimizes in front of the Warren Buffett crowd. Okay? Uh, short term, obviously it's going to make a damn bit of difference to ICOs because they're not going to be listed. Because Goldman Sachs, NASDAQ, and Barclays are not going to list something that's not state sanctioned. Period. So I think it's good long term, but not good short term. It's not going to do anything short term. What do you think the next addition to Coinbase is going to be? Oh, shit. Um, Ooh. Man. I've been worried that it's going to be Ripple. Yeah. I've been worried. Um, I don't believe in Ripple. We can go into a whole big rant on that one. Um, having said that, I will say up front, I do own 500 Ripple. I don't believe and I don't like the project, but I don't believe in Walmart. I don't like Walmart. Sorry, Pete. I know urban economy over here. Um, just the way it works, but I still, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. And banking on people not wanting to be personally responsible, which is how it'd be Ripple, banking on people who want other people to take care of them is pretty much always a safe bet. So, I don't know. I don't know who Coinbase is gonna put up next. Um, there's been a lot of rumors of, of Ripple, but boy, I'd love to see a Cardano. I would love to see that. Or bad. Have you looked into that yet? So we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to I think you've been cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the gong's been hit. You have reached a quota, so I'm going to go. That's exactly. I mean, I watched all three of them. Okay, you have your hand up? Sense? Prime example. 
uh, 10 months ago. I'm really bad at time, I could be wrong. There was an individual, he was not a client of mine, he was one of those friends of friends, but anyway. Um, there's an individual who went to Cuba when we opened up our, our travel there. Like, are we still on travel there? Is that a thing? Still on travel? Um, so he traveled to Cuba, got onto his phone, logged into his Coinbase account. Coinbase cut off his access for four months. $340,000 was locked up in his account on Coinbase because he logged in from Cuba. So as long as you're part of that system, you don't control it. You're not fully part of the crypto. Does that make sense? You'll also hear the phrase, if you don't control your private key, you don't control your money. Same thing. If you are on Coinbase, they control your private key. If you are on Bitfinex, Binance, any of those, you open. If you have your money on exchanges, they control your private key. If you don't know your private key, you do not control your money. So to get your feet wet to Coinbase, that's my advice. Long term, learn more to control of your luck. Does so that make sense? I say that a lot, but I'm waiting for somebody to give feedback. Somebody shake, thank you. Shake your head. Feel like I'm doing something. So, did I answer your question? Is that good? You still with me? Okay. Okay, we have another question here. Didn't you ask enough last night? No. Definitely not. So, um, if we reach it to, or if we reach to 2100 when we mine all the bitcoins. Um, we're not going. Yeah, 21 million. Okay. It's just under yeah. Do you foresee the transaction cost escalating because the miners will no longer have incentive to mine uh, other than transaction costs? Or okay, so. Okay, so let's let's explain some terms here real quick, because not everybody is up on the three-hour conversation we had in the parking lot last night at the So, <laughs> what, what he's saying is right now, the Bitcoin buyer goes and process the transaction, creates a, a block. That Bitcoin buyer is awarded 12 and a half Bitcoins for their effort. Now, it's not a buyer anymore. It, we're all part of a big pool because it takes so much processing power. So we all split that, but that's the general idea. So they're awarded 12 and a half bitcoins plus whatever fees are associated with the transaction in the block. So what, what Gavin, right, is saying is that when we mine the last of the blocks, when we're at 21 million or again, it's slightly below that. The technician he won't, he won't allow me to say 21 million about the asterisk. So when we're at the almost 21 million level and we are done mining new bitcoins, miners have to exist entirely on the fees. Now, will we not mine as much? Two parcels. Will we lose miners because they will not be getting reimbursed? Keep in mind, the fees at that point are like 0 .0003 Bitcoin. I mean, they're not getting really Bitcoin anyway. Two, if we're around in 21 and in 2140, which is when the last block supposedly mined, I feel like the fees that we made to a global currency, the fees are probably covered. It's hard to say. I mean, we're over 100 years away. I wouldn't be around for that, probably. Um, but let's go, let's go back to the core of the question. If miners make less money, this is the core of the question. Tell me if I'm wrong. If miners make less money, and therefore miners turn off their machines, so they're not mining, will that affect our net worth? Yes, for at most two weeks. Every two weeks, the difficulty of Bitcoin adjusts based on how much hashing power there is out there. If 20% of the, of the network all of a sudden stops mining, well then what happens? Our difficulty goes down 20% or some factors there. You follow me? To make the blocks, every two weeks, the protocol adjusts itself to the mining difficulty so blocks are made every approximately 10 minutes. So if we lose miners, we could, technically speaking, run the entire Bitcoin network right now on a handful of machines in somebody's garage. It would run just fine. It doesn't take that much processing power to run the network. The only reason we have a lot of processing power is because the more decentralized we make it, the less the government's can screw us. If I have, think of it this way, and this is also part of the power of Bitcoin. If everyone in this room had $10,000 in their pocket, it wouldn't be worth my time to try and rob individual. You. 
you. I wouldn't, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be worth the risk, right? Ten grand, what's that worth? But if everybody here pulled their money into a bank, it's worth my time to rob the bank. Same way with everything else in a decentralized system. If if I have processing power all around the world, it's not worth your time to knock out. You follow me? Where, you know, the most you're going to find in one spot is about 1%. Okay, fine. You take that out. I got 99% that's still running. So that's part of the power of decentralization. So does that answer your question, Kevin? The, the mining protocol, the, the, the Bitcoin protocol will adjust difficulty based on hash power. That's, that's the takeaway from that. But it could take up to two weeks. We may have upwards of two weeks of a crappy network while it adjusts itself. Uh, one of the biggest concerns I've always had with cryptocurrencies is to say it's very decentralized, is it being like stable or anything like that. Uh, someone who doesn't know a whole lot about cryptocurrency, and I've seen like rapid uh, changes like downward shifts in uh, money. What, Stable and viable sense of currency. Yeah, just speak up that last part, sorry. Um, when do you think it makes a viable sense of currency for that like since this can be very unstable at times? I don't view it as a currency right now, I view it as an investment. Um, for us as Americans, stability is is we have a stable dollar. Let's be honest about it, we're kind of spoiled. And we can complain about our government all we want, but in general we have a fairly stable system here. So to an American it's primarily an investment. You know, it's a way for us to think about getting more dollars. Uh, now, keep in mind the volatility question that you have is, so the, the question you have is about volatility. So why would I want to use Bitcoin, why would I want to have Bitcoin if I am skittish volatility, is that fair? And why does it move so much? Let me throw some numbers out there to you. Bitcoin right now, does anybody know what the price is right now? It's uh, $9,711. Uh, $9, Holy shit, it's gone up since this morning. Yeah, it's $9,711. Um, I mean, I don't care about that. Uh, but, it has quite a bit. I'm going to what's going on. I'm just taking that. So, at $10,000 a coin, the market cap, does anyone here not know what market cap is? Okay, so market cap is what something is totally worth. So if you have a million of pieces of something and every piece is worth $5, you have a market cap of $5 million. Following? So the whole project is worth $5 million. Okay? So we have brought a little over 17 million Bitcoin out there. And we have, let's say we have a price of $10,000. So let's say our market cap is $170 billion. Do you realize Bill Gates by himself is almost worth our entire system? Just by himself. One dude by himself is almost worth our entire system. In other words, we're the 11 year old that made it to the NFL. And we're getting knocked around by the 300 pound linebackers. And that's just how it is. Not only are we small enough to manipulate dramatically and massively with small movements of money compared to the rest of the world. For example, does anybody know what the total market cap is of all the companies in the S&P 500? Any idea? $24 trillion. So they are 24,000 to our 107. Does that make more sense? That I'll kind of put it in perspective for you. They could move 1% of the money out of just those 500 companies, and there's thousands of companies out there that are listed on the, on the exchanges. They could move 1% of their money into us and nearly triple us. Think about that for a second. That's nothing. So the volatility that you're seeing is from two things. A, we're very small. We're getting knocked around constantly. B, the referees don't care we're in the game. Follow me? Yeah. We are not a regulated market. They are allowed to pump and dump us. As long as they don't lie, they cannot get in trouble. As I understand it. Now some, somebody in here knows more than me. Maybe we'll explain a little bit better. But as long as they don't lie about what they're doing and intentionally mislead, they can pump and dump us all day. And there's nothing stopping them. It's a matter of pump and dump is an amusing term, right? For run the price up, run the price down, you know, bury it out. Um, anyway. So, 
Here's what I'm going to say to the Bible that's holy question. First of all, this is a change in paradigm. What I mean by that is we are actively changing the way in which the world works on a system that's never been seen before because it couldn't be seen because the internet didn't exist. Follow me? No paradigm change comes without four people crying, three people pissing their pants, and one guy going to sleep through. Follow me? We're going to have an enormous amount of volatility, but I think stability is starting to come. The regulators are already talking about regulating things. Again, um, I'm okay with that on some level. It's okay kind of dirty. Uh, but as the market cap of Bitcoin gets larger, it will take more movement to affect us. We will start becoming more stable at that point. Again, once this 11-year-old kid becomes a 300-pound linebacker, now instead of taking 30 pounds of, of effort to move us down the field, it takes 300. Does that make sense? The bigger we are market cap, hello, I see you, I see you, the protocol didn't count for waiting. So, um, that's what I'm getting at, just give it time. Oh. Uh, what would you, would you say that actually backs up like uh, cryptocurrency for the most part? Like you uh, used to have a like, US currency with the gold standard, but it doesn't necessarily exist anymore. But, like, it's not just necessarily exist, it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, what backs up? Okay, let's start by, and then, easy, 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 down. Um, what backs up the U.S. currency, the fact that everybody uses it, the fact that everybody wants it, quite frankly, we've got the most interest problem. It's just the fact that people want it. What backs up cryptocurrency? Because people want it. We can sit here and we can debate all day about the technical uh, specs of one coin versus another coin. All we're doing is debating why someone would want it. At the end of the day, it's demand. If demand outstrips supply, price goes up. Vice versa, price goes down. So what backs up Bitcoin? I think what backs up Bitcoin a lot is that it's, well, there's a lot of things that back up Bitcoin right now. Let me go back. What backs up Bitcoin? Desire. Desire based on functionality or the idea they can get more money for it. Just depends what their motivations are. But at the end of the day, it's demand that backs up Bitcoin. And I, and I know that kind of sounds like I'm being a little pedantic, but I mean, that's what it is. That's what every market is. You know what I mean? Um, so there's probably a big marketing push in there. There's some hype. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I gotta stop talking. Ten minutes. That's it. We've been here that long. Huh. Um, I had a quick question. So to my understanding, Bitcoin has been around for a long time, but I had just started hearing about it last year. So why did it become popular all of a sudden? Nobody wants to believe it. Period. I mean, period. I mean, it's pretty much that simple. Um, so when let let's, let me let me put it to you another way. If, if I walk up to my buddy who sells Hondas for a living and say the best thing in the world just got released by Chevy, he's going to do the longest and the damnedest job he can to make sure nobody hears about it. So when you're talking about something that's going to change the way wealth is moved, it's going to mostly eliminate the need for big banks. Uh, you, yeah, people aren't going to, it's not going to be hyped up. Bitcoin white paper was written in 2008. Um, I think the first block was just no nine. I could be wrong about that. Uh, but it's it's taken a while. I mean, it's just taken a while. I don't know how else to explain that. Um, people aren't going to pay attention, especially in America. People are not going to pay attention to things until it produces some kind of dollar form. I mean, that's what we want to be thinking. I will say this though: I was in shortage London in 2012 and used Bitcoin. If you get outside the U.S., your, your vision will change. Um, Europe and Southeast Asia are, are adopting Bitcoin tremendously. I mean, there's almost 5,000 merchants in Japan right now to take Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an official currency in Japan. They announced that back in uh, May, I think it was, about a year. But I was in Shoreditch, London, in the underground tunnels, buying a sandwich at a place called Income Soup, which I thought was brilliant. Um, if I had a sandwich in a place called Income Soup with Bitcoin from my cell phone in 2012. So I think part of your answer is people don't want it to succeed because it scares them. Part of the answer is you live in America and 70, what, 74% of Americans don't even have a passport. So it's just, we're insulated. 
So regarding regulation, um, how would you propose we regulate a global currency on a national level? And what will that solve? Okay, let's go back. So when I say regulation, I'm talking about like ICOs, people putting together projects and releasing them on blockchains. I'm not talking about regulation of Bitcoin. You can't regulate Bitcoin. Um, commodity tokens are going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to regulate because of the decentralized nature. Now, will they tax them? Yeah, they'll tax them. That's not regulation. But on the ICOs, if we go into a situation where someone wants to put together a project and a business proposal and they want to satisfy all the requirements to release an ICO that they would have to release or satisfy if they were releasing an IPO, Okay, initial public offering on stock exchange, I'd be okay with that. That means somebody took a look at them and said they have a business plan, they have a real model in place, they are legitimate, we have their fingerprints, their DNA, and we know where they live. I want my $1,200 back and I'll lease your loan program in Japan. Um, so, or loan or lease, I guess, please. Uh, regulation of ICOs will not be difficult. Because ICOs have a centralized nature, ICOs are some guy sitting there or some group of people sitting there releasing it into a country or releasing it into a group of people trying to raise money. Bitcoin is not centralized. No one owns Bitcoin. No one controls it. Yes, sorry. Yeah, the uh, typical business in Cape Girardeau has not been able to uh, outfit their uh, credit card machines to treat a chip. How, yeah. how easily will they be able to, to, be able to convert to accepting Bitcoin in their business? So I'm actually working actively to change that, at least until I move to the Philippines next year, and then I'm done with the crap. So I, I, the last client I worked with was Cape Cars. Cape Cars sells cars right now in cryptocurrency. And what we did with them is we sat down and, you know, on a big purchase like that, it's fine. But we sat down with them and figured out their processes, figured out where Bitcoin interjected, and they decided what they wanted to do. Do you want to get even convert fiat, or do you want to save so much, or whatever. If you're talking about, again, the coffee transaction, the point of sale of the, of the coffee transaction, there are companies out there that act as what I would call merchants, middlemen. Kind of like with Visa, like I don't have a contract with my own shop, I don't have a contract with Visa. I have a contract with Square. My, they, they process my credit card, they took a percentage cut, and they send me the money in my bank account, right? There are processors out there right now that you can sign up with and they will act as your Bitcoin intermediary and they take 1%. So implement integration of a uh, middleman into a point of sale system, that's going to take a bit. But your ability to have it as a side, if you want to, that's here right now. And they're actually integrating, a lot of squares talk about actually integrating Bitcoin payments in their payment system. And they'll do it directly at the terminal, because it's their system. So it's taken a while. Um, I think the Lightning Network's going to change a lot, because when we can start sending transactions at about a quarter of a second for about a penny, you're going to see credit card or what I would call point of sale credit card esque implementation take off. We're probably about nine months from Lightning Network being made, like, like actually something that people want to use, so it's been released, as you call it. Did I answer? Is it good? Yes. Okay. What do you think of Tim Draper's prediction of Bitcoin being 250k by 2022? I don't give a shit. Even after he correctly predicted it hitting 10K when before 2018 in 2015? Well, here's the problem. I mean, first of all, first of all, no one knows. Do I think Bitcoin's going to go up? Absolutely, I think Bitcoin's going to go up. I have an excessive amount of Bitcoin, and because I think it's going to go up. My philosophically, my end game is that I don't care what it goes to because by the time I need it, it should be a currency, you know, I don't have to worry about what it's in dollars. But, let's go back to the core of the question. The core of the question is, what do I think about a guy who's been right once? Um, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just saying, like, like, and I say this because this is something that I go over in my class. People who are going over like technical analysis, I always have these guys come up to me. It's like I had a, uh, who, who was the guy last night? Yeah, um, every time the S&P moves, 
Yeah, yeah, it's a correlation, it's a correlation. My answer to him was, hey, I'm a Pisces too. Because it's kind of the same thing. We can try and find correlations all we want, and we can try and figure out what things are going to be, but my advice is stop worrying about prediction. If you believe in something, do something with it. And I know that sounds like I'm skirting the question, but I honestly don't pay attention to anyone's prediction. I just don't. However, I do hope McCaffrey has to eat his penis. I, I, I hope that happens. You know? Okay, I have a question. Yes. Um, so somebody who is, um, you know, from a little bit older generation, I'm amazed at uh, all the questions that our students are asking, and I'm a little bit behind times myself. Somebody who took your course at 5 a.m. this morning to catch up on cryptocurrencies, so I don't know. Search for bar, by the way. Um, a question uh, that I have, can you talk a little bit about divisibility on Bitcoin? And obviously, not from investment perspective, most of the students here in the room cannot afford to buy a Bitcoin. Um, can you talk about different businesses that students can shop at online, like overspot.com, okay. given the budget constraints that they have? Okay, so the visibility of Bitcoin goes into why is Bitcoin considered a currency, which by the way, you feel as though it's not. Um, the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank just tweeted, and it's so weird to say I tweet. Um, but they just tweeted recently they feel as though Bitcoin satisfies most, if not all, currency requirements to be considered a currency. So that was interesting. Um, the visibility of Bitcoin, you don't have to go out there and buy $9,700-ish, right, of Bitcoin. You don't have to buy any Bitcoin. It's not a share of stock. You can buy one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, a fraction of a penny's worth if you want. It wouldn't be worth sending it to you, but you can do it. So you can go in there. I have a client, I have clients of mine, he's a mechanic, uh, not a gay man, I can bring him up. But he's a mechanic across the street. And he has a setup in Coinbase where he just does $10 every day. Just whatever the price is, dollar cost average, $10 every day. And that's fine. And he gets these little, sorry? Two minutes. Well, they can stay longer if they want. I mean, okay, it was raining outside. Um, so, I mean, I know you just want to stay here all day. Um, so you can you can buy pennies worth of Bitcoin if you want. That's that's the edge of visibility. You don't have to go out there and spend ten thousand dollars. And people go, oh, well, I don't have a whole lot of money to put in. But you know what? If it grows ten percent, ten percent of five dollars is still fifty cents you didn't have. The idea of long term saving is not the little ten percent you're going to get today. What's going to turn into in forty years from now? So uh, where can you use Bitcoin? So. I'm gonna, I just did a video on this a few days ago. Or a, couple, a few weeks ago, sorry, probably a couple of weeks, about a month and a half ago. And if you want like an actual better list, go to mycrypto.guru, you know, .com on the end. Mycrypto.guru, click on the blog, I did a video where you can spend it. Overstock is one of them. You can buy plane tickets on Expedia.com with Bitcoin. Uh, Dell, Newegg, of course a lot of the tech companies that are online allow you to take Bitcoin. Um, you can go to gift.com, G-Y-F-T, pretty much buy a gift card from anywhere you want to go to, and you can use Bitcoin to buy that. There's, there's companies out there for 1%, you can send them your Bitcoin, and they will mail a check to your landlord if you want to live in Bitcoin for that. Uh, there's a lot of services out there that will allow you to use Bitcoin. A wallet that I use, especially when I travel, because I travel a lot, Airbits, A-I-R-B-I-T-Z. It's for Android only because I don't know how to explain that. Um, and so Airbits, you can install it on your phone. Actually, you might have an iPhone now. And uh, you can actually go somewhere, turn on your location services, and it'll tell you location-wise who's around you that'll take Bitcoin. There are places in St. Louis right now, Sister City's Barbecue in St. Louis will take Bitcoin <coughs> at the register. They actually have an ATM there too. When I stayed in Manila a few weeks ago, there was an ATM across the street. So, yeah. We have one last official question, and okay. then your students have to go to other classes after the special for three years old. Uh, and anybody who wants to hang around to ask any one-on-one -on -one questions, also feel free to do so. Oh, hi, I was wondering if you had any opinions on proof of work versus proof of stake or proof of authority. You're the second person to ask me that today, and I haven't done any research on it yet. 
So I don't do a whole lot of mining. Um, there's proof of work, proof of stake, and proof of capacity. They're in the big ones right now. I don't have an opinion yet. I, I, I hate to tell you that, I just don't. Um, I am going to look into it though. You know, it's not on the radar. Sorry. And then on that note.